Okay, welcome back. Um, so let's go back to these two examples that, that I talked about last time. Here was my first example that I talked about last time, uh, vector configuration. And the second example that I talked about last, one, last time was a graph. A graph looked like this. And I labeled it A, B, C, D. E, F. Okay. So these were my two examples, and we discussed last time how actually there were a lot of similarities between these two examples, even though this is linear algebra and this is graph theory. And what I want to do today is, is um, elaborate on this topic. 
So remember, what I wanted to do here was find independent sets of vectors. Okay? Independent sets of vectors. Okay? So let's go ahead and make a list of the independent sets. So the, the easiest are the single vectors, which are A is independent, B is independent, C is independent, D is independent, and E is independent, but F is not independent. <coughs> The second thing are the pairs. So AB, AC, AD, AE, BC, BD, BE, CD, CE, and DE is not in there. And nothing involving F should be there. Now let's talk about the, the triples. Okay, so for example, A, B, and C are independent. A, B, and D are independent. A, B, and E are independent. A, C, and D are independent. And A, C, and E are independent. Am I missing anything? Does anybody see anything missing? There's one missing, the empty set. There's no relations among the vectors in the empty set. Okay. So these are the independent sets. Okay. Now, as uh, someone in the online forum mentioned, if you were to do this list for, for this graph, you would get exactly the same answer. So this is the list of independent sets in this vector configuration, but this is also the list of independent edges in this configuration if independent means not forming cycles. Okay. And I'll I'll leave I'll leave that as an exercise for you guys and you should you should really go ahead and, and check it that you get the same list. And the third thing that I will ask you to check is that in in my third example, with the question about matching men and women, if you, if you look at the possible brides, then you get exactly the same list. And this is, again, I'm going to leave to you as an exercise that you can do at home. <laughs> and so when I say that, these three problems are closely related to each other. The reason that I say that is because they all have this notion of independent sets that we are going to discuss now. Okay. So now I can finally tell you what this word matroid means. Definition. A matroid is a pair e comma script i where the first thing e is just a finite set e is a finite set which in these cases you're going to think that the set is A, B, C, D, E, F, so called the ground set. This is kind of the, your playground. These are the objects that you are playing with, A, B, C, D, E, and F. And script I is going to be this list. I is a collection of subsets of E. And I'm going to call these independent sets. OK? But of course, if, if, if I want to give this list the name independent sets, 
then this list better satisfies some basic conditions of what we think independence should satisfy. So what things should independence satisfy? Well, there's a kind of an obvious thing, which is that the empty set should be independent. That makes sense. The empty set is independent. Okay. This is the first condition for independence. The second condition for independence is another one that should make perfect sense, which is that if you have an independent set, and you take a subset of it, then that's also independent. So if you have sets i and j, and your set j is independent, then I think in any reasonable notion of independence, it should be true that i should also be independent. So I think these two are very clear. And I'm going to demand a third condition. Okay? And it says the following. That if I start with two independent sets, such that one of them is smaller than the other one, let's say i has fewer elements than j. then I can basically expand the set i using one of the elements in j. In other words, then I can find an element j, which is in my set j, but not in my set i, such that I can add this element j to my set i, and that should still be independent. Okay. I think you'll agree that out of these three, these two feel kind of obvious, and this this one feels feels non-trivial. And uh, this is so much the case that, that people have a name for this one. It's called the exchange axiom. And whenever you want to check whether something is a matroid, you have to check these three things. And it's usually going to happen that these two are pretty obvious. And the third one is where you actually have to do some work. Okay. How old is this definition in this form? I think this definition is from the 30s. And uh, I mentioned that it's due to a couple of people. Whitney is one of these people. Um, but I, I can't remember exactly. But so this is a matroid, OK? And of course, if, if I claim that these are motivating examples for the theory of matroids, then, then these sets better be matroids. For example, this better be a matroid. If I want to check if this is a matroid, then I have to check three things. First of all, so let's check that this one right here, this very specific collection is the set of independent sets of a matroid. The empty set is independent? Sure. Here it is. You have to check that if, I, if you choose any independent set, then all of its subsets are going to be in there. It's going to take you a little bit of work, but you can find them. A, B is here. A, E is here. B, E is here. A, B, and E are here. The empty set is there. For the third condition, you have to show that for any two independent sets of the same size, you have this exchange axiom. So let's pick two random ones. I don't know. Maybe AC and ABE. AC is smaller than ABE. So what the exchange axiom says is, you must be able to use one of these guys to expand this one. Okay. So either ABC is on the list, or ACE is on the list. And in this case, it happens that both of them work. It could be that only one of them works, but at least one of them has to work. And you would have to check this for any pair of independent sets of different sizes. If that's true, then you have a matroid. Okay? This is the definition of a matroid. And so in fact, there should 
So is that kind of the inverse of the second one? It's kind of like saying if you have a set, then you have to be able to take any subsets of it. And then the third one says if you have a smaller set, you kind of have to be able to go. It's a, that's a very good point. So this is, this is a way of saying if you have a set, then everything underneath, everything included in it, is independent. And this one says if you have an independent set, then it gives you some guarantee that something including it is independent. So these are, these are in a sense, one, one is going down and the other one is going up. It's a very good point. So proposition one. Okay. The first thing we're going to show is that if you start with any vector configuration, you get a matrix. You would hope that that's true. Okay. So let E be a finite set of vectors. in some vector space. <coughs> Actually, bef before I say this, let me make a, a very small parenthesis here, which is going to interest some of you, and it's not going to interest others of you. Okay. I said E is a finite set, okay? And some people might complain about this. Yeah, I was now, about it. So <laughs> if you think about these things, please complain to me and ask me, why are you saying E is finite? Well, in, it happens a lot in combinatorial classes that, that they will tell you some of the things that I'm going to say today are also hold for infinite sets, but I don't care. <laughs> and this is exactly what I'm I mean, I'm not going to quite say it that way, because I want to sound a little more inclusive of other ideas. But uh, really, all of the matrix that we are going to see in this class are finite. But I want to point out to you that there is a theory of infinite matrix. So you can study infinite matrix. And some people really care about this. But we're not going. We're not really going to do it. Is that kind of like the analog of if you have a finite dimensional vector space? You think of you can think of an operator as a n by n matrix. But if you have an infinite dimensional vector space, you still have operators, but maybe you can't think of it as a matrix anymore. There's there's many ways in which you could go to infinity here. Yeah. For example, you could start with infinite dimensional vector spaces, or you could. Start with a finite dimensional space, but an infinite collection of vectors. So really, you can take this theory in different directions. And I want to point out especially to you people in the, in the camera, since I, there's a lot of people in Colombia that are interested in, in logic and model theory. I, I don't think there's such a big interest in, in that area, in this <laughs> department. But I, I want to point out that in, in model theory, they study matroids. And most of the matroids they study are infinite. And actually, I will offer that if, if there is enough interest among the whole class, and we will judge that by the discussion forums, if there is enough interest, we'll talk about this. But unless you ask me about, about it, I won't. I will always assume that my sets are finite. Okay. Okay. So, so that's my little parenthesis about infinite matrix. And now let's go back to what I was trying to do, which is to show to you that Finite collections of vectors give rise to matrix. Okay. So let E be a finite set of vectors. Let I be the collection collection of independent sets, linearly independent sets, linearly independent subsets of E. Then this is a matrix. You set E and your collection I form a matrix. Okay. Proof. First axiom is, again, absolutely trivial. The empty set is linearly independent.
Second axiom is also trivial. Okay? Because if you have two sets of vectors and you have a linear dependence relation in I, then that linear dependence relation also appears in J. So these two really hold almost without any proof. And the interesting case is the interesting axiom to check is the exchange axiom, which says, so, right, so, so let me say it again. Let's say that you have two sets i and j, and let's say that j is independent. Okay? If j is independent, that means that there are no linear relationships inside j. Okay? But if that's the case, then there better not be any linear relations inside i. Because as soon as you have a linear relation in i, that's also a linear relation in j. Okay. So if you don't have linear relations here, then you don't have linear relations here, which is exactly what this is clear. When I say trivial, I, I, don't, I don't mean it doesn't require any thought. What I mean is more that it, it's not really about the linear algebra. It's kind of a, an, go through the definitions and you'll see that it makes sense. Here we're actually going to have to do some linear algebra for the, for the third one. Okay? So let's assume that you have i and j independent, and let's say that i is less than j. Okay? Let me give a name to i. So let's say that these are my vectors in i. I'm going to call them i1. Actually, maybe for the camera I should make this a little bigger i equals i1 up to i sub a, OK? And I'm going to suppose, I'm going to prove this by contradiction. I'm going to suppose that this j does not exist, and I'll reach a contradiction. So suppose that i union j is not independent Sorry, for any j in j minus i. And I'm going to reach a contradiction. What does this mean? i equals j is not independent. It means that I have a linear equation. Okay. I have a linear equation relating these vectors and j. So I can write it as scalar 1 times vector 1 plus so on up to scalar a times vector a plus scalar times vector j equals 0, where the ci's and the c are scalars in whatever field you're working on here. Okay. What does this mean? The, the first thing I'll say is that c is not 0. Why is c not 0? Because if c was equal to 0, then you wouldn't have this, and you would have a relation in i. So c is not 0. And that means you can solve for j. And j is equal to minus c1 i1 up to minus c a i a divided by c. OK? And what this means is that j is in the span of i1 up to i a. Okay. So j is in the span of i1 up to i a. Okay. Now remember, this is true for any j in j minus i. In other words, j minus i is included in the span of these guys. And remember that this is just i. OK? So j minus i is included in the span of i. And of course, i is included in the span of i.
So if j minus i is included in the span of i, and i is included in the span of i, that means that their union is in the span of i. And let me wrap around this board and go over here. If j is included in the span of i, that means that the span of j is included in the span of i. Okay. But what dimension does the span of j have? Well, j. J is an independent set, right. so the span of J has dimension number of elements of J. Mm -hmm. So this guy is J dimensional. Size of J, dimensional. And the span of I, again, I is also independent, so the span of I is I dimensional. So what I just showed to you is that this J dimensional subspace is inside this I dimensional subspace which implies that j is smaller than or equal to i. I should say these inclusions are I'm sometimes a little bit careless, but these are all people people aren't always careful, but it what I mean is that this is a subset or equal in each case. Subset or equal, subset or equal, subset or equal, subset or equal, and that's why I have less than or equal here. Okay. But what was my assumption? My assumption was that I is less than j, and I just proved to you that I is bigger than j. That's my contradiction. And I'm done. Okay. So there is the proof that from a collection of vectors, you get a matrix. Okay. And this, in a sense, validates why this might be a good axiom to have. Maybe if I wrote this for you, you, you might think, where, where did he get this? Well, one reason to have this, one reason to care about this axiom is that at least vectors satisfy this axiom. This was really the, the, the original motivation for this definition. Any questions about this proof? Okay. So this is good. Vectors give matrix. probably imagine that the next thing that I'm going to do, which is show you that my second example is also an example of a matroid. So proposition two. Do you have a question? Is, is that the definition of independent edges? There's no, uh, no cycle? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I actually haven't uh, defined that explicitly, and I'm about, about to do it. What does it mean to be independent for a graph? So. Let's say that I give you a graph. Okay. This is a graph. You're supposed to think that this is the set of vertices of the graph. And this is the set of edges of the graph. Let I be the collection of independent sets of edges. What does this mean? 
It means edges such that when you, when you draw them in your graph, you don't form any cycles. It means they don't form any cycles. So G is my graph. I have the set of edges. I have the set of something that I'm calling independent. So what we hope would be true is that my set and my collection of independent sets are a matroid. So we're going to prove this, and this is when we just did a linear algebra proof, and now we just happen to be in a combinatorics class where you're going to have to do some graph theory. Okay. But again, I'm going to show to you that, okay, so proof. And again, you're going to see that the first two statements are not really, they don't have a lot, any combinatorial content. They're almost true by definition. So first, I'm supposed to check that the empty set is independent. In other words, that if I have no edges, then I have no cycles. Makes sense, right? <coughs> the second axiom says, I have two sets of edges. J has more edges. I has fewer edges. It says, if J forms no cycles, then I forms no cycles. That makes sense. If you, if you throw in the edges j, and you didn't form any cycles, then when you remove some of those edges, of course you're not going to form any cycles. So again, this is kind of true without any mathematical argument. Yeah? So is the only reason that the first one is there to make the second one make sense? Or is there going to be more reasons later why we want the empty set to be the only one? Because the, the thing is, if you don't demand this, there's only, there's only one difference in, in adding this, which is that there are, there, the trivial matroid has one independent set, which is the empty set. If you didn't have this axiom, then the trivial matroid would be a matroid that has no independent sets. And this is really a technicality. You shouldn't think of this as, a, as an important axiom, because the only difference it makes is whether you allow no independent sets, or whether you force this one to be independent. It's really kind of inconsequential. OK, so here we have to do some mathematics. Axiom 3. Okay. And before I'm able to prove this exchange axiom, I have to make an observation. And my observation is this one. If I have a set of edges which is independent, then when I consider the, the subgraph including only those edges, so the subgraph that has the same set of vertices, but now instead of having all the edges, you're only going to put the edges in I. Okay. So this is a graph. It has these vertices. It has these edges. This graph has this number of connected components. I'll explain what that is in a second. What I'm saying here is pretty simple. I'm saying, let's say that you have your graph, OK? So maybe it looks like this. I don't know. I'm just making up any graph that I can think of.
what are the connected components of a graph? They're basically this piece, this piece, and this piece. The, the different components. Co connected means you can go from any vertex, vertex to any other one. So any graph is naturally split into the vertices that you can actually reach from a certain vertex. This one has three connected components, for example. But so hold on, because the blue is my complete graph. Uh -huh. Well, I don't want to say complete. My whole my whole graph, graph G. What I'm saying is now, look at a collection of edges which is independent. So not all of them, but only some of them. Independent means you never form any cycles. I don't think this is going to show up in the camera at all, so let me do it like this. Okay, so th these black bananas that I drew are a bunch of uh, edges, and they are independent, right? There, there are no cycles formed by any of the black edges. What I'm saying is, if you only pay attention to those edges and you ignore the other ones, then the number of components is exactly v minus i. What are the connected components in this case? Let me. Yeah, thank you. Let me draw this subgraph v comma i here in red. So the vertices are the same. Oh, you have all this extra vertices hanging out by themselves. So this is my first component, this is my second component, and then these are these four guys. Then I had a uh, please try to make sure that I do this correctly. It's kind of hard to do it on the spot, but that pentagon here. I think that's right. So this is my original graph, G. And now here I'm going to consider the graph, which has the same vertices, but only, only these edges, which now I'm going to draw red. And now you're actually going to be able to see them. What I claim is that when I fill in the red edges into here, the number of connected components I'm going to get is v minus i. And I'm going to prove it to you. How many connected components do I have right now? V. I have zero edges, right? I haven't drawn any edges. And each vertex is on its own. Each vertex is a connected component. Now, I draw an edge. Let's say I draw this one. How many connected components did I lose? I lost one connected component because I had these two connected components and I glued them. Every time I draw an edge, I glue two connected components. I draw this edge, and I glue these two guys. I draw this edge that's going to glue this connected component and this connected component. Every time I bring in an edge, <coughs> is this right? I think the first one was all. The first and second one. Yeah. One well, anyway, you. <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully you see the point of what I'm saying anyway. <laughs> Every time that I add an edge, I lose a connected component. Yeah. And be, so maybe this one, maybe this one. And then you can't, if you know you don't ever make a cycle. How could I not gain an, a connected component? For example, by adding this edge right here. If I were to add this edge, I wouldn't gain a connected component. But I can't add that edge. Because I would form a cycle. And, and that's basically the proof. That's the proof that v comma i has v minus i connected components. So this is my observation. This is the observation I'm going to use to prove this axiom, i3.
how am I going to prove my axiom I3? Well, I'm going to take Suppose i is contained in j. No, sorry. i and j are not contained in each other. All we know is that i and j are independent, and the size of i is less than the size of j. And just so you can keep track of these guys, remember that the edges of i are blue, and the edges of j are red. Okay. So let me draw the graph v comma i. Okay. So this graph has some vertices, and it has some blue edges. And no cycles are formed. Okay. This is my graph v comma i. Because i is independent, I have v minus i connected components. Okay. j is some other set. Now, what I have to prove is that I can find an edge in j, a red edge. In fact, maybe let's, let's draw So this is v comma i, and v comma j is here. And it's just some other set of edges. And this one is supposed to have more edges than that one, which is true. <coughs> This one has seven edges, and this one has eight. So what I need to prove is that I can find at least one edge, one red edge, <coughs> that I can draw into here and not form any cycles. That's what I need to prove. Okay. And again, I'm going to do it by <coughs> contradiction. Suppose that every edge, a red edge, j, I mean, how could this go wrong? How could it go wrong that you add a red edge to here and end up being not independent? The only way it could go wrong is if you added the edge and you formed a cycle. Okay. For example, <coughs> Let me change my picture a little bit so that something can go wrong. It seems like nothing can go wrong in this. Case. For example, if I, if I were to try to add this j over here, then I would form a cycle. That's the only thing that could go wrong. Okay? I'm going to assume that everything goes wrong. So every time I try to do this, it goes wrong. That means that every edge j in j minus i uh, forms a cycle. In my graph v comma i. Okay. Every time I try to add a red edge here, I form a cycle. So then imagine that I just add them one at a time. Add the first one, form a cycle. Add the second one, form a cycle. Add the third one, form a cycle. I add every single one of them. Okay. So you add all red edges. What graph are you left with here? You're left with a graph where you have every blue edge and every red edge. Okay. Now, what can you tell me about this new graph with edges i, union j? Well, you see, every time that you added an edge from here to here, you closed the cycle. And that means you didn't connect two components. You just connected things that were already connected. So here you connected these two vertices, but they were already connected. 
So no matter what you add, you added all the red edges and you never formed any fewer components. So what you can say is that this graph also has V minus I connected components. So every time you try to add a red edge, you just close some cycles, no new connected components. Now I'm going to take this graph, and I'm going to keep only the red edges. Now there might be some red edges that are red and blue, okay? because some edges could be an I and in J. But what happens if I get rid of all the edges that are only blue? So now I take this graph and I remove the edges that are only blue. Only blue. Or well, you get some other graph. that contains only these guys and these guys. How many connected components does this guy have? Well, definitely at least this many, because this one is more disconnected than this one. Here I had a bunch of things. If I disconnect them, then I'm going to form more connected components. So this guy, which is the graph v, comma j, has at least that number of components, if not more. Okay. So if you delete edges, you disconnect the graph even more than it was already. OK. But how many connected components does this graph have exactly? Well, the, the observation also applies to j. j is independent. And so this guy has. Exactly V minus J components. Okay. So what did we just prove? We proved that V minus J is bigger than V minus I. In other words, that I is bigger than or equal to. Which again contradicts our assumption that I was less than J. Now Question? The figure you have there with the red, the red graph, those are two, two components, though, right? These are actually <coughs> six components because you have this one, you have this one, then this guy alone, oh. this guy alone, this guy alone, and this guy alone. Six. Every isolated vertex is a component. And that's why you, get, you gain more components when you disconnect. If you disconnect two guys, then here they were one component. And there they become two isolated vertices, more components. Okay. Um. So this is the proof that uh, graphs satisfy this, this exchange axiom and therefore also give you a matrix. Did you have a question, Miranda? Um, I'm not clear with definition of connected component. Can you say that one more time? OK. Um, so. A connected component, that's the best way to say it. Let's say a graph is connected. If, so this is definition, right? I'm just to clarify some of the terms here. A graph is connected if you can walk from every vertex to, from any vertex to any other vertex. If there is a path between any two vertices. Okay. So for example, in this graph that I have here, this is not a, a connected graph because you cannot walk from this vertex 
to this vertex. Okay. So the connected components of a graph are the pieces that are connected. The connected components of a graph are basically the, the largest possible pieces that are connected. The maximal subgraphs which are connected. Okay. So this is the this is in a way the, the formal definition of connected. And I think the more you think about this, the more you're going to get used to just the, in the intuition is going to be clearer to you than the definition. You just look at it, and the pieces that look connected, those are the connected components. You stare at this graph, and you see it has three pieces. This one, this one, and this one. And, and this is the way to formalize it. I want you to, I want you to read these, these two proofs carefully. And if you're not clear on them, make sure that you understand them very well. But particularly because one of the homework exercises is to do exactly the same thing for my third example. Okay. Proposition three is going to say that if you start with this situation that we had of, this is called a bipartite graph. It has a, a left side and a right side, and the edges can only go from left to right. So you have some graph like this. If G is a bipartite graph, and the split into left and right is called by partition. Big word for nothing. By partition just means left and right. Okay. So let let G be a bipartite graph. Um, let I be the collection of subsets of R that you can marry off according to what we said last time. The collection of subsets of R, which can be matched to L. Okay? Then this is a matrix. This is left, this is right. Then the ground set of a matroid is the right people. And the independent sets are the ones that I described. What does it mean to be matched to L? 